Are you an author who's tired of the long waits and low royalties? Exact Rush is here to change the game. We specialize in publishing with precision, and we get your book to market in just three to six months, not years. But we're not just about books. We also support your photography, web design, and content creation needs. Our focus ranges from spirituality to pop culture. And we're excited about our diverse lineup of upcoming releases. So if you're ready to keep more of your hard-earned money and get published faster, Exact Rush is your ticket. Visit ExactRush.com and turn your creative dream into a profitable reality today. Tap into your most original thinking, organize your ideas, and create the opportunities to launch your creative work. Unlocking your world of creativity with best-selling author and brand innovator, Mark Stinson. Welcome back, friends, to our podcast, Unlocking Your World of Creativity. And all too often when we think of creativity, we think of songwriters and artists and authors and all these people that we think are in the creative field. But I love to think of creativity in the hospitality field as well, particularly in the restaurant business. Wow, who doesn't know a creative idea when they see one in the restaurant business? But there's a lot more to running a restaurant than being a good chef. <laughs> and that's the topic today with my guest, Tom Rutledge. Tom, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me on. And like I said, I, I've loved exploring this idea and every time I, I get a chance. But when your name came across my desk and said, here's a guy with 30 years of restaurant experience, but also now in management, accounting, ac processes, like actually making money in the restaurant. I said, there's an idea. We got to have this guy on. <laughs> so I'm really glad to have you. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's an interesting field and making money, oddly enough, for this business is often the last thing on someone's mind, which is a problem in the industry. It's a, a large scope. Everyone comes in it artistically. I want to make the best this or I've, I'm passionate about beverages and I want to open a bar, wine pairings. But then the reality sets in the minute the key kind of goes into the door and you got to figure it all out. And mm -hmm. frankly, I think there's a lot of it's professional problem solving more than any small businesses. You're a professional problem solver. You wear a lot of hats. The restaurant business just tends to get people where that last step, that whole idea of profitability, how to keep the doors open so you can continue to pursue your dream and your creative endeavors artistically comes like a absolute avalanche. It just mm -hmm. comes and it's really aggressive. We're thin margins. So you really have to pay attention to the details and, it's a ton of fun. I'm excited to talk about it with you. Yeah, let's start uh, peeling that back. Tom's role, he co-founded a group called the RDMS Group. It's uh, Solutions for Restaurant Management and Accounting. A and maybe we just start there, the accounting, because that's obviously people want to open a business to make money. But accounting doesn't sound any a lot of fun. Making money does. But what do you what does the mind of the entrepreneur, the restaurateur who says, yes, I want to make money. Of course, I want to make money. But what are they willing to do to actually put that into place? So we, I, I didn't get into the industry to open an accounting firm. I, <laughs> I'm on the same level. It came as a great business model for us out of a place where we go, a lot of people are a lot better at me than cooking. A lot of people are a lot better at me than making a cocktail. But everyone I'm working with has no idea how this is affecting the bottom line. So we organically came from a problem solving place ourselves. This is something that restaurants need. So how do we build a model that takes it away from the daily grind and we pick up all the things people don't want to do, but more importantly, accounting is actually learning just another language. It's the language of business. So an entrepreneur can't move forward if they can't speak the language of what they're doing. So. If you can be a chef, congratulations. You better know all the different mushrooms and vegetables that are out there. But if you can't speak to food cost, mm. you're only doing half the job, right? Mm. And what's fascinating is the re-education of what your job is. So a chef isn't the guy who makes your food. A chef is the guy whose ideology, his creativity is driving the kitchen. And his, he has to teach his cooks how to cook. He's not supposed to be cooking. You don't look at the maitre d' or a manager of a restaurant and say, that guy doesn't have enough tables that he's waiting on. Yet, 
chefs take this mentality that they need to be slinging pans as it were. So what we do is we come in and say, there's an education here that we're going to work with you on. It's amazing that you've been able to produce this menu, but you have to be able to make it sustainable. You have to be here next year to keep doing it. You have to know, hey, if you want to buy new plates, the food's got to make money to get that cool plate you want to buy. It's all encompassing. And so that's, can you build your team so they can make your food? Can you build a menu so it is profitable? Not just entertaining, not just wowing people and getting you written in magazines, but will you be here next year is what we're trying to bring to people. So I, people's eyes roll back when I walk in the room. I get Boy, that's it. a powerful question. I got to pause you on that. Yeah. Where are you going to be here next year? It's like, nice review. How's it going to go? Yeah. From yeah. There. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. You got people sitting in your chairs. Yes. And the biggest lesson we teach people, it's about going back to problem solving. People need to realize that to be a good restaurant owner, you need to be a landlord and you're a landlord of the seat that the person's sitting in, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can change someone's dynamic of how they're approaching it, it's not my menu is the best tasting menu in the city that I work in. Okay. Not everyone knows as much about food as you do. So they may have a difference of opinion, right? But if you can take your idea and say, I am the landlord of this seat. Now think about it. If you're McDonald's, your rent for your seat is 10 to 12 bucks these days. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you can give them a plastic chair and a melamine tabletop and a plastic thing. If you're a Michelin three-star restaurant, your rent is maybe $500, $1,000, $2,000. You have to give the marble. You have to give all these fancy things. So getting people to shift their thought process that brings their creative side and their business side together in a way where the business side doesn't necessarily seem like work or a foreign concept. If you think about what's what am I charging for renting my seat for a period of time, you've just restructured how they think about their business. Yes. Tom, for sure, even if we were having this interview in the fall of 2019, <laughs> we'd be talking about economics and technology and so forth. But yes. I don't know of an industry that was more affected by the pandemic. And now, digital tools, QR code menus, uh, door dashes, it, it's a total new business. I said at the end of 2020 that the real struggle for restaurant operators was going to be when the at the end of the government programs, right? So mm -hmm. we got propped up. I give props to the amount of money that flooded into the industry. We were taken care of to a large degree. But if for people who weren't watching every nickel and dime, understanding the programs, the major issues that are going to be facing restaurant industry just started, really just started. All of the loan programs are starting to be paid back. We call it in the industry a cover. So a guest who dines at a restaurant, they call that a cover. So paramount to what we look at, one of those little metrics that's super important for us is what's called a cover count. How many people did you serve yesterday? For a lot of the country, the amount of money people are spending at restaurants is pretty much the same, but less people are going out. That's the trend, less cover counts. We have to find ways to, like you mentioned, get them with a, a QR code so that they can get into our database. Actually, the funny part is technology is interesting in our industry because it's so disparate. Nothing talks to each other. <laughs> Everything is moving. One guy came up with a cool app, doesn't talk to the rest of your software. You're a small business owner. Now you have all these things flying around. Using the right tech, getting people, getting in groups, talking to other business owners. Did it work for you? Did it not work for you? People live in silos. They're not using that hive that industry get together enough. We try to foster that by being able to see all the trends that are going on, but the it is harder today than it is to, to run a restaurant than any time during the pandemic because the economies are that much difficult literally right now. Mm -hmm. Most closures are going to happen in the next six months to a year or most, uh, that's a misnomer. I want to even rephrase myself. Not as many restaurants fail as people think. Many of them change hands. There's a difference there. Mm -hmm. Very it, interesting. It, it's undercapitalization is main main issue facing us today. You bring up this idea of not enough idea sharing and the hive mentality. And maybe because it's the old competitor mentality, 
does every bar and restaurant think they're competing with every other bar and restaurant? Therefore, I better not talk to my competitor. Pretty narrow view, but give me your insight on that. I think that there, when you find a cluster, like sometimes you hear of that hot neighborhood. That's right. right? That hot neighborhood usually has a lot more of a convivial attitude. I'm so excited you open. More people are coming to our neighborhood. They'll try right. you on Wednesday. Eighth and Street is really hopping. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Those areas tend to realize that people can feed off each other. Now, if I own a taqueria and you open one next door, we're going to have problems, right? But <laughs> the concept of walking down the road, there are, you can go to any major city and probably find a restaurant association where they hold meetings. But go into the suburbs and you don't. Mm. That I, I find that the urban environment sees it as an ecosystem. And more often than not, the suburban sees it as competition. Interesting. Yeah. And yeah. it's a mistake because the suburbs have people going out less often. But you're on that Thursday, Friday, Saturday crowd. So you're, you're really trying to pack them in. The suburban population is funny because you have that 5 to 7 o'clock. You don't have that 4 to 11 o'clock you have in the city. Yes. So. You need more cohesion when you get out into the suburbs. So interesting. Thanks for this glimpse inside the business. Let's Absolutely. talk about your business for a little bit. Great. You decided to focus on this restaurant industry and really develop relationships. And yet relationships last as long as the restaurant, I guess. It was less than, you were talking about changing hands. Are yes. there people who are in the business and yes. decide that they're going to be restaurant tours, whatever brand hangs on the shingle that day? Short answer is yes. It's a fascinating industry because when you get down to the hourly worker, the cooks and the servers and the bartenders, it has a tendency for everyone to speak to the transient nature of that mm -hmm. job right. in particular. And by and large, if you're talking purely statistics, that is true. When it comes to ownership and management, we still see the lifers. There's something about the industry that attracts people to it, whether it is the odd hours or how complicated it is, or that are that want to pursue that artistic endeavor. We've been fortunate. I I love my industry. I came at this, as I mentioned, from the artistic pursuit. I I came at it from a want to pursue culinary and just being obsessed with. I like to play where I work, if you will. And my business model came from out of a deep want to help the people I was working with in a way that was not just one location or building one company, but helping the small business. And I've been fortunate to say that the industry is, when you get to consultants, when you get to wine professionals, liquor professionals, purchasers, there's such a larger ecosystem out there than just the individual operator. It's fascinating how much business the restaurant business touches. Mm -hmm. So from that point, it gets really interesting when you start looking at the producers, the suppliers, the farmers, the vinters, and, and everybody else. So to expand your question there, there is such a diverse world that supports this business. That's really what gets us pretty excited. Well, that's interesting. My guest is Tom Rutledge. His company is RDMS Group. Uh, he's consulting restaurants of all kinds. And, and I'm curious, based on all the dynamics and challenges and obstacles, but opportunities, do most of your clients come to you, uh, let me call it a rescue mode, like they've tried it already, and now I'm not being as successful as I hoped. Tom, what can you help us with? I would say we're north of 50% for sure in the, I didn't realize I needed an accountant, but now mm -hmm. I realize I really need an accountant. And mm -hmm. I would say for every business owner out there, and I don't care if it's restaurants or not, if your accountant is not providing you a service that helps you run the business on a daily basis, get a different accountant. And there's a difference between the accountant who's doing your taxes, your CPA at the end of the year, and a financial professional, whether that is an accountant, a bookkeeper, an analyst, whatever you want to call that position. It has to be a return generating process. Yes. There's, you have to know what's going on in your, uh, on the day to day and the week to week of the business. And people learn that quickly, whether it's the bank account slowly becoming to the point where you're not going to make payroll that you realize you have to fix that. The business people who get into the restaurant business call us before they spend a month, a dollar on construction, before they're writing their business plan. And we start the process at that point. We help them with fun. What kind of funding makes sense? How much funding? I will tell you out of 90% of the people who reach out after they open the business, 90% of those people started with not enough money to open the business. They made bad assumptions and mm. they're 
that is what didn't see the runway. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Construction can go crazy. Training goes off the wall. The equipment costs more money than you thought. What do you mean? It's going to be six months longer before I can open the door. I signed a bad lease. I have to start paying rent. Now the list is more or less endless. This is that creative problem solving. Don't pretend you know everything. Get feedback. You don't have to spend an arm and a leg for professional services. Most people are looking for long-term relationships. So whether that's a lawyer, don't find someone who's just going to write an operating agreement. Find someone who's asking questions about what you want to do for the life cycle of the business. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the bookkeeper. (laughs) Pardon me. Of course. We've been talking about uh, profitability, scalability, and all that sort of thing. You've dialed this all the way back to concept, (laughs) pre-construction, looking at all the costs. Uh, Certainly, let me ask you this about the business uh, models. Employee costs have gone completely hockey-sticked. How did that affect the business? So uh, I'm going to answer your question by bringing up maybe the most important number for any restaurateur to focus on, which is called prime cost. Okay. So if, if you don't know that term, this is the absolute gold of a restaurant for restaurants in particular. Prime cost is your total cost of goods plus your total cost of labor compared to top line sales. So just to give you some metrics, if you're at 65% prime cost, so for every dollar somebody spends at your restaurant, if you can limit it, to only 65 cents go to your cost of goods, food, beer, wine, liquor, and beverage, and your total cost of labor, you're doing pretty good. All right. Okay. That only leaves 35 cents for everything else. We'll get that's yes. a whole other conversation. But labor during COVID, uh, you have a pulse and you want a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> well, uh, yes. here you go. I'll give it to you. Everyone's regressing from that and trying to figure out what that is. Depending on your state, I'm based in California, so we have mandatory sick pay, mandatory 401k in San Francisco, and the list goes on. Where we used to be maybe running 28 or 30% labor cost, we're seeing 35 to 40 in a lot of operations and they don't know how to curtail it. To go back to your earlier comment, if I don't have to pay a person to get the food to the table, a QR code sounds pretty good. Mm Mm-hmm. But the good operators are thinking this is still a service model. They're still here to celebrate something, even if it's just blowing off steam and getting a cup of coffee. This is a human business and people go out to interact either with the other person on the side of the table or the environment as a whole. So the QR code can't just be slapped on a table and you think you've solved your labor problem, right? That gets back to creative problem solving. That guy who was worried about what to do with the mushroom now needs to worry about what to do with the mushroom and all this other stuff, right? Mm-hmm. It's not just hire a server, put them on the floor. They've been a server for 20 years. That game is done. That mm-hmm. doesn't exist anymore. And how so. do you counsel people then? Let's come full circle to yeah. why you wanted to open a restaurant to begin with. Great mm-hmm. food. But I'm going to underscore, as I do with my clients, the brand experience. Yes. That most of you can get a steak at a lot of places. You can definitely get a cup of coffee at a lot of places. So there's got to be something about my experience in this. Do you help counsel? Again, I'm thinking about the costs and trade offs and profitability of creating some experiences. Without a doubt, you have to frame it. I go back to my landlord conversation. Mm -hmm. What kind of money is that person spending at your location? What is your what is the goal that you have, the vision you have for what you want to create in on the plate, create in the glass, create table side? What is your vision? Are you charging enough? Do you value yourself the way the client needs to value you in order to pay for the experience you want to present so you can be here next year? Or have you overvalued yourself? And to your point, the guy down the street's doing the same thing and they're going to pay half price. You, you don't have a model. So mm-hmm. first we have to understand that. We break that down to the average check. What is your check average? What are people spending when they get here? And does it fit? If you're in San Francisco and you're going out for a reasonably priced meal, you're at 40 to 60 bucks. Mm -hmm. That's a baseline price. That's a neighborhood restaurant price for a person to go dine. If you're going to do that 45 minutes up the road in the suburbs, you just entered finer dining territory for the suburbs. So you have to look at time and place. And it really is about service and storytelling. What is the story you're trying to tell? And does somebody understand that organically? Restaurants shouldn't be existing to educate. 
education can come as part of the story you're telling, but no one wants to go take out a notepad and understand what biodynamic farming is because they're being told that's what the carrot is. Now they need to take notes, mm -hmm. right? To be like, hey, what is a biodynamic carrot? And get a story and be like, oh, these guys really care where it comes from. That's super cool. Those are two very different experiences. All right? of a sudden, I had an episode of Portlandia coming into my head right there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. And going back to location, Tell me about this carrot. How was it yeah. born? <laughs> I was in a town about 15 minutes north of me, and it's a fun town. It's quirky. And a woman went up to a person at a grocery store and said, did this apple fall from the tree or was it violently picked? Yes, yes. And, and the guy, and I said the same thing. I was like, is there a camera around here? Is someone, <laughs> is this a real story? But open a restaurant down the street from that place and that's who you're going to deal with on a daily basis. That's right. So that you have to include that in the storytelling. But when we come into a restaurant, we have to understand the DNA that they want, then help them understand that the DNA that the guest wants. Not many restaurateurs have the luxury of doing only what they want to do. Mm -hmm. You have to listen to the guest. You have to be willing to modify and compromise and adjust. And more importantly, have systems to coach your entire team to make that vision a reality. That's where a lot of people, the consistency of that experience is what we focus on. Yes. You did it well last week, but you're not doing it this week. And what are you going to do next week? Where do your systems come together? And my favorite word in our consulting is accountability. Mm -hmm. restaurants desperately lack accountability in most of what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. The system behind accountability, I should say. Well, and good, we try to bring a lot good of Good lesson to learn, but you should. And I, and I would counsel our listeners, every time you've heard the word in the restaurant business, you could take the word restaurant out and put your industry, your avenue of business in there too, because listening to the customer, there's no no bigger lesson that we could all use. And uh, you, myself in the in the accounting firm. That's While I'm in the restaurant business, I, I can't be selling the equivalent of a fifty dollar hamburger for thirty bucks. I'll go out of business, mm -hmm. right? Excuse all the food metaphors. It's what we do for a living. But oh, exactly. And on the other hand, you can't charge fifty bucks for somebody who says you're not delivering me a fifty dollar hamburger and or hamburger experience. Uh, you know, goes hand in hand. Correct. Tom, you've given us such great uh, background and insight. Thanks for lifting the hood on this industry. I want to go back to then the uh, the purpose or why somebody opened a restaurant. Hmm. But sit in that seat for a minute. Guide us from the insider point of view. We may not all want to open a restaurant, but we sure like to go to good restaurants. Sure. What can we do to be better restaurant diners, better customers, and support our local restaurants right now? First one, especially modern day right now, go to the local restaurants, go support somebody who took the time to open the business. Even if it's for that cocktail on the drive home, if it's for that appetizer that maybe you just wanted a snack, getting out and showing support is the biggest step for helping restaurants today. It gives them what they need. If I may be so bold, owners and managers, good owners and good managers, they want feedback, but they don't want it on Yelp. <laughs> <laughs> Give that five star on Yelp and write an email to the owner about anything that you thought was lacking. They, I personally love, love to read them. When I send people to a restaurant that I own or manage or whatever it may be, and they go, it was great. Everything was perfect. It doesn't help. Mm -hmm. Was the lighting too loud? Was them too bright? Was the music too loud? Was the server not get you your refill on your water? Fat? Like, Giving feedback in an honest way, that good and bad at the same time, goes so far. We want to hear how we can get you to come out more often. I will tell you the kiss of death in many restaurants is we deal with this all the time. I love that restaurant. I can't believe it closed. When was the last time you went? Three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. You didn't love it that much. Go out and support it. The other one is, and, and I hate to say this because I don't want to give excuses, a little bit of patience these days is helpful. Mm -hmm. It is hard with staffing nationally. We work on, with people all over the place. It is just difficult to hire, train, retain, and everything else. So like any business, right? If you go to your mechanic and he says he's super busy because and he's got to yes. put you back a week, he's probably missing another mechanic right now. The restaurant is in the same place. You just feel it more intimately. 
So I would say for all small businesses, a little bit of patience these days is appreciated. I was going to say every store around the corner and in the mall could use a little empathy. Uh, 100%. Yes, indeed. My guest has been Tom Rutledge of the RDSM Group. We uh, stamped our creative passport north of San Francisco today, and uh, we're going to continue our around-the-world journeys with creative practitioners. What's been fun about this conversation is that everything we can learn about the restaurant business, restaurant owners, operators, the ecosystem, all the suppliers that you've been talking about, to the servers, and how we, the customers, can play a part in that uh, ecosystem. It's just been a great conversation. Tom, I can't thank you enough. Oh, I appreciate it. It's so much fun to talk about it. Thank yes. You. And listeners, come back again next episode. We're going to continue these conversations about how we can get inspired, but most of all, how we can organize and really put a business plan and a financial plan behind our businesses. After all, that's our intent to have some financial gain from something we do. We need to have the plan in place. And then ultimately gaining confidence, gaining connections to launch our work and sustain our work out in the world. That's what it's all about. And that's what this podcast is about. So until next time, I'm Mark Stenson, and we'll continue unlocking your world of creativity. Unlocking your world of creativity with best-selling author and brand innovator, Mark Stinson. This program was produced by BSB Media. Creators of IntelliKey Leadership Stories, Unlocking Your World of Creativity, and ThePeaceRoom.Love. We've created a special offer just for listeners of the podcast. You can get the book, A World of Creativity, for a special price of $5.98 for paperback. And the Kindle version is only $0.99. Cents. Go to mark-stinson.com to take advantage of this special offer.